This week on CrossFeed. Mormons versus the lesbians. When is dead really dead? Religion and the election. Monk versus monk. Arm guards at the church. And welcome to Crossfeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts, in gorgeous New England. Where it's, uh, you're, you're on the opposite end of the country, something that I'd like to start out talking about tonight. Um, you've heard about the wildfires going on over in California. And um, there is another podcaster out there. Uh, his name is Doug Price. And uh, if anybody has not heard of the radio adventures of Dr. Floyd, you want to check it out. It's a really great show. Um, it's uh, like a radio drama kind of thing. It's it's a family friendly one. It's been going on for years and really high production quality. They get a um, bunch of Hollywood stars to do voices. And it's even been being considered for an, uh, was a Grammy. Um, which is the first podcast to ever do that. But the guy that does the voice of the lead character, um, Doug Price, he does uh, Dr. Floyd's voice, his house burned down in the fire, in, in those California wildfires. And so it's fully insured and, you know, and, and he'll be all right. But he just ended his job working for Fox and... Uh, he's kind of on a day-to-day thing right now, uh, never knows when he's going to be working and stuff. And so until the insurance money comes in, which could take a while, uh, his uh, co-host, uh, Grant Pachoco, is asking anybody that can help out to send donations. Um, this is It's not tax-deductible or anything because it's just going to help a guy out that needs some help. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'd like to encourage anybody interested uh i'll put the uh the link across the video and i'll also put a link in the show notes uh but it's drfloyd.com it's d o c t o r f l o y d.com slash doug and uh so if you could check that out um you know we donated to him and uh really encourage people to do that you know it's Getting up on Thanksgiving, people like to, you know, give to charities and things like that as part of their celebration of Thanksgiving. And, you know, I'm thankful that I've got a house to live in and he doesn't. So uh, anybody that can help him out, that would be great. You're thankful he doesn't have a house to live in? No, I'm thankful that we do. <laughs> oh. He said, I'm thankful we have a house to live in and he doesn't. <laughs> Oh, no, I feel bad for him. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Just, just wondered. Well, where should we begin tonight? Um, you know what? We've got one. Uh, well, actually, kind of two election stories, but we've got one Obama story. And since people are really kind of sick of all of the election stuff. Uh, I do want to do this story, but let's do it first and get it done with. And if anybody's just absolutely tired of it, they can just skip past this one to the next one. That sounds good. So uh, this is a George Barna, who's uh, famous for his uh, different surveys and things uh, relating especially to Christianity. And... He has some information on how the evangelical vote affected the election. Um, we have a couple snippets here from the whole thing. Uh, it says, evangelicals chose their candidate on a different set of indicators than did other voters. When asked their primary reason for supporting the candidate they selected, 40% of evangelicals said it was because of the candidate's position on moral issues. Only 9% of other voters listed that as their driving reason. Everybody else voted based on the economy and the housing crisis. Um, other significant reasons for evangelical voters included their candidate's political experience and his character. You were the chosen one! 
And interestingly enough, evangelicals' vote was 57% for McCain and 42% for Obama, roughly, according to his, his survey. Uh, you know, which is a 15 point gap, but less than the 29, four point gap that uh, Bush had against John Kerry. Yep. So, so, uh, it's, it's good to know that people are voting based on moral issues. You know, I, I think that that's really important. Um, you know, there's just so many factors to consider. Um, when, you know, when you're considering, uh, who to vote for. And it's, it's nice to know that people do still vote based on, on morality. Because the, you know, the economy fluctuates and, you know, you can do a little bit about it, but not a lot about it. Um, uh, and it's, it's hard to say how much, how long it takes for economic change to actually impact the average consumer. Um, you know, I've heard people say that it can take up to, eight to 10 years before you really feel the effects of, uh, of a particular, um, presidency or, or whatever economic change. Um, I'm not an economist, so I don't know how true that is, but you know, if that's the case, people are generally voting exactly the opposite of what they think they're doing because what, how the economy is under one president is really generally because of the decisions of the previous one. So if there's any economists out there, you can let us know um, how valid that is, or if that's just something that people made up to make their candidates look good when they don't look so good. Well, I, I think it's there, there's marginally very little that a, a president can do um, other than mess with interest rates and things like that. That's in the purview of his administration. Uh, for example, back when um, you were in diapers in 1982, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, you know, that Paul Vockler, you know, for, I don't know, Paul Vockler, um, you know, raised the interest rates and pretty much brought the economy to a grinding halt in order to break the back on inflation. And that's when we went through the, um, uh, the, uh, you know, deepest recession that I remember. And, uh, you know, the Rust Belt, you know, emptied out and the whole, um, <clears throat> unemployment rate was almost, it was, it was like 10%. Uh, but it was ne- absolutely necessary in order to break, you know, the, the, the inflationary spiral we were in from the late 70s, uh, in the Carter administration. Yeah, and it so kind of worked out okay too. Like that. I mean, you know, you consider the rest of the 80s are considered, um, uh, pretty prosperous time right um or you can get it from, so from there you can talk about that or you can talk about you know lowering the, the tax rates you know can can help and things like that um but overall there's really not much i mean it's not like we have a com- command economy it's it's not like you know the president can say okay this is what you're going to do i mean w- we went through that with uh you know the way wage and price c- controls under nixon and Gerald Ford's Whip Inflation Now campaign. Um, you know, so there's just not too much they can do, really. But uh, uh, but people want to feel like somebody's going to do something. But it is good to see that some people, you know, do vote on a more moral viewpoint. You know, what? because it, it seems to me that, you know, regardless... Uh, whether or not you necessarily agree with the person's views, it's the person's in personal integrity that's going to make the biggest difference. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I thought in many ways Bill Clinton was a very good president, even though I disagreed with him a lot of things. But um, you know, his personal moral failings kind of overshadowed anything that he managed to accomplish. Yeah, and I've found, I mean, now take a look, just for instance, and this isn't a specific president. Um, but you look at the, um, abortion. Okay. Before Roe v. Wade and what was the other one that really made it widespread? Uh, uh, (laughs) Doe v. Bolton. There you go. Um, you know, before those, most people considered abortion morally wrong. 
since it's legalized, as soon as you legalize something, then it's pretty, you know, quickly adopted. It's, it, you know, people start to say, well, if it's legal, it must be okay. You know, and um, so, you know, and, and now looking at presidents, you had where you had, um, you look at the, the drug, uh, the, the, the drug rate or, or whatever you call it, the uh, drug abuse rates. Um, they were pretty low under uh, Reagan and um, Bush one. And then it kind of spiked during the Clinton presidency, Mr. I didn't inhale. And then it started going down again when Bush two became president. So I don't know if that was just coincidence, if there are other factors involved, you know, but I looked at it and went, you know, here's some people that have very strong stands against drug abuse and that helped the rate, you know, and then someone came along and kind of made it look cool and just kind of joked about it. And then, and, you know, and then it went up and then someone else came along and said, no, you know, this is really not a good thing. And so I think that people do look to, um, to the president to some degree for, you know, right or wrong, uh, for a moral compass. I think to a certain extent. Well, as long as we're dealing with elections, we might as well go ahead and deal with Proposition 8. Yep. All right. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this commercial. Um, and uh, tell you what, we'll show the commercial. I'm going to put it in right here. And what I want you to do is while you're watching this commercial, figure out, um, see how, how quickly you could figure out who's sponsored, which side sponsored this commercial. All right, here's the ad. Can I help you? Hi, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're here to take away your rights. We'll take these. Thank you. Fact, Proposition 8 would take away the legal rights of thousands of same-sex couples. Fact, members of the Mormon Church have given over $20 million to pass Proposition 8. You can't do this. Who's going to stop us? <laughs> Hey, wait! We have rights! Not if we can help it. That was too easy. Yeah, what should we ban next? Say no to a church taking over your government. Vote no on Proposition 8. Okay. You can probably figure it out by the obviously end. That, <laughs> obviously, it was sponsored by the Mormons. <laughs> you know, you know the Mormon Gestapo was obvious. You know, came through. This is their idea of America. <laughs> now, you know, the thing that really struck me about this ad was the fact that yes, the Mormons gave a lot of money to um, to push uh, Proposition Eight through, but they weren't by any means the only ones. I mean, there were all kinds of Christian groups that supported Proposition 8. And, you know, Christian groups, um, and I'm not, by saying that, I'm not necessarily saying, well, okay, I'm not saying that, that Mormons are a Christian group, or at least I wouldn't consider them such because of their teachings. But um, but they, they kind of allied for this one. And, um, you know, they're... Uh, <sighs> You know, they're they're sort of singling out the Mormons because Mormons have a stigma. But you know, I sorry, this is one of those situations, one of those rare situations where I agree with the Mormons. Not that I agree that you should be able to walk into a person's house and you know, illegal search and seizure. You know, if you have a California gay marriage license, you can keep it. It's not valid. It doesn't mean anything, but you can keep it. <laughs> well, of course, it's interesting. Um, the group that everybody agrees put it over the top was the black vote. Yeah. And uh, so uh, 
now it's, you know, uh, um, they're, they're struggling with this because, you know, on the one hand, they, uh, you know, appreciate the, uh, support given to President elect Obama, but they're not so happy about. <laughs> so maybe, the, uh, you know, maybe so when they did this, uh, this ad, instead of Mormons coming into the house, they should have had a few black people. I'm sure that would have gone over well. <laughs> would have gone over great, I'm sure. <laughs> but you see, they can't, they couldn't attack them, you know, that, no. that wouldn't be, you know. They're not a valid sensitive. group to attack. Right, Mormons, and anybody can attack Mormons. Yeah, man, we do it all the time. Um, or so we've been accused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've been accused. I, I thought this was just a, 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 a despicable, insulting, um, I mean, I don't, I disagree, I mean, disagree with the Mormons, uh, on, on their viewpoint in the, in theology, but I just thought it was a, a very insulting and degrading commercial. Yeah, yeah, it is. Because you know what? I've got lots of Mormon friends. I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised how many Mormon friends I have. Um, but, you know, you make friends with people and then you find out they're Mormons and it's like, well, <laughs> I'm still be friends with you, you know. Um, and, it, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, that has nothing to do with whether you can be friends with somebody or not. And, um, you know, none of them are like that. They're all pretty normal, regular, nice people, you know. Um, they're uh, all the ones I know are pretty politically conservative. Um, and I'm sure would have sided with, uh, the Mormon church on this one, but then again, so did I. So maybe that's why I'm friends with so many of them. I mean, yeah, this is, this is a, a case. Uh, it's interesting to see what now they've sued again, but this is California Supreme Court saying that this was a revision to the Constitution, not merely an amendment. And that would have to come through the, um, the legislature. So it's going to be interesting, but the chances, most people don't think the court would see it that way. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But no, I just thought, I, I don't mind hard hitting commercials, but I just thought this one was really hitting well, below the belt. Yeah, there's hard hitting, and then there's misrepresentation. You know, and, and that, that's what this was. This was, this was painting a completely false image. And I, you know, I understand the point they're trying to make, but why'd you single out the Mormons? You know, why did you, you know, when, when they weren't the biggest group and there's so many other groups involved, it <laughs> just really, really frustrates me. So. Well, like you said, it's, they're easy to go after. That's what they went after. So, uh, but, uh. So, you know, I, I'm going to defend traditional marriage, um, even though I live in Massachusetts. Um, but, um, you know, got to be, you know, wouldn't we, they'd be, be upset if, you know, the, 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 the group that, um, you know, the yes on eight people, you know, had some two, you know, militant gay people, you know, forcing the, you know, you know, forcing their way into a courthouse or something. Oh yeah, you know, and saying you know recognize us at gunpoint. Um, well, that would have been just blown out of the water. Oh wow, that would have been a national or international uh, problem. You know, for that matter, and we've we've made this point many times, but the Muslims overall would be again or would be in favor of Proposition Eight too. You didn't have Muslims come knocking at the door. That's true, uh, but. Uh, of course, um, what was it? Who was it? Um, ah, lost my train of thought. Let's move on. I think we kind of covered the story as best we're going to do it. And uh, not too much more we can say. Um, well, as long as dealing with fighting, let's deal with the fighting monks of Jerusalem. <laughs> Man, uh, this was a huge story. It, it, the whole thing just... It, it's it's just one of those things that's so sad. It's goofy. Yeah. So, all right, this is uh, um, in in Jerusalem's old city, and this is at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Sepulchre, um, which is the traditional. No one really knows where Jesus, um, you know, where Golgotha 
was or where the tomb was um, or anything like that. Although Paul Meyer at Western Michigan State University says he thinks this is probably the most likely place. Yeah. It's the, the um, if, if you go over there on a tour and you go to the garden tomb, all right, that's very unlikely to be the place. It's, that's more of just uh, uh, this is what we think it looked like, you know, but right. it wasn't it. But um, but yeah, okay. So it's it's probably the place, or it's 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 uh, you know more likely than anything else they've come up with. So, but they uh, there's six different Christian groups um, that are that all kind of maintain and worship in different sections of this church. It's kind of like that. Um, another place like that is the Church of the Nativity. Uh, where you can go there and you can see there's this sort of star on the floor. This is the exact place where Jesus was was either born or laid in the manger here. But it, they kind of zoom in right on that spot. And uh, and I've heard that it's actually, that one's pretty likely too, uh, as far as, as accurate. But um, I, I'm, I have a hard time with, they they nailed it down to this particular, you know, place. Um, you know, this square inch or whatever, but, um, but anyway, this is, um, you have, the, there's a, a, an Arminian procession marking the fourth century discovery of a cross that was believed to have been Armenian, used. not Arminian. Oh, sorry. There's so a difference. They're not Baptist. They're <laughs> Armenian. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, um, discovery of a cross believed to have been used in Jesus' crucifixion. Um, how many how many crosses are there that were used in his crucifixion? <laughs> no idea. And anyway, Luther once said that there was so much wood from the cross you could have built an entire village in Germany. Uh, so... Anyway, so they're having that the Armenians are having this procession. And the Greek Orthodox monks wanted to post a monk inside a structure built to once believe Jesus' tomb called the Edicule. And uh, the Armenians said no. And so these Greek Orthodox monks blocked the procession. And a riot uh, broke out. And um, now, I know this sounds really stupid, okay? But believe it or not, there's actually a huge tradition of Christian groups fighting over the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Matter of fact, uh, I mean, it was so bad that the um, when the Muslims were in charge of Jerusalem, they forced them to, ha- to keep the peace, and they, you know, you couldn't do anything without his permission. Matter of fact, I saw a picture, and I wish I'd, uh, you know, realized Dale was going to bring the story up. He just picked it today, brought it up today. Um, but in Christian History Magazine, about six months ago, they had a picture of it, and they showed this ladder that's sitting on like the top top of it, of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It says that that ladder has been there for like 600 years because they were told, leave everything exactly the way it is, don't touch anything. So that ladder is still there. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's just, you know... Unfortunately, it, it is true that these you know, all these Christian groups have fought over that. You know, this is so goofy if you think about it. Like, hey, you're being disrespectful to the to the site of Jesus' crucifixion. Bam! You know, <laughs> like, yep. um, hmm, what's yeah, more if, disrespectful? If you, <laughs> yeah, if you click to the story, I mean, there's this there's one guy's got this blood all over his face and. Uh, other guy, you know, I uh, got a gash across his head, and I mean, it was quite a battle. Man, what did they teach these guys in the monastery? These are like these are like martial arts monks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we need some mecha manga monks. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, hey, that's for our buddies who are Mecca Manga Bible stories. Next thing you can do, Mecca Manga Monks. <laughs> can you imagine the story of Luther done in a manga, Mecca Manga style? Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Wouldn't that be? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Just, just imagining, you know, <laughs> using this 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 mech walks up to the, this uh, giant uh, Wittenberg church door, <laughs> pulls out this like laser sword. <laughs> 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 Like hologram projectors. <laughs> hmm. But anyway, it's a uh, an, an old fight. Uh, the you know it's kind of sad when you get groups together and they do these these fightings. It's, it, what the other thing, that, of course, that interested me is this was an Armen- This was an Armenian Orthodox group. So you had the Armenian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox both fighting. Mm-hmm. But the other question is, why couldn't they compromise? Why couldn't they say, okay, yeah, have the Greek Orthodox guy in there? Come on. More the merrier. Jump on in. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't serve their kind here. You know, <laughs> what's that? You know, is the gospel for everybody? You know, unless it's some Not kind of... Not if you're an Armenian, apparently. Because, you know, this wouldn't even... Like you said, these are both Orthodox groups. Eastern Orthodox, uh, we would say. And so, it's not like there's a fellowship issue here. You know? It's not like this is a... You know, it was not like it was um, 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 Southern Baptists and Roman Catholics or something like that. You know? So... I, it's not like it's a Missouri Synod Lutherans and just about anybody. <laughs> just about, <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, I don't, I don't know. I, just to me, it just seems that okay. You know, we've got our our differences among the different churches and and different and those those differences are important. But you know, we need to treat each other in love, and when we discuss our differences, um, the way to. Uh, to hammer out those differences is not with a hammer, you know, unless you're, you know, hammering something onto the Wittenberg door, but you know, not that you shouldn't be beating each other up over your doctrine or your practice. You notice this is about practice. This wasn't about doctrine because this is the Eastern Orthodox church where their doctrine is their practice. But, um, you know, if it was doctrine, they they might just have an interesting discussion about it. But, you know, St. Paul said, speak the truth in love. You know, and if you don't have truth, then you can't be loving because you're not really loving someone if you're not telling them the truth. Um, but at the same time, if you are telling them the truth, but you're not doing it in a loving way, then you don't have the truth because the truth is all about love. And so, you know, these guys both felt that they sort of had this truth. But, you know, it wasn't even that, though. And that's, I guess, the thing that they're they're getting riled up about nothing. You know, I always tell my kids when they start arguing, you know, if you're going to argue, find something worthwhile to argue about. You know, (laughs) because argue about ridiculous things. I see so many couples that are, you know, on the verge of divorce and they're arguing about, you know, oh, he leaves a toothpaste cover off all the time or something like that. It's like. You know, find something worthwhile to argue about. Well, here they just showed that wonderful saying, speak the truth in love and carry a big stick. (laughs) I don't think that's how it goes. So, uh... Well, it should. (laughs) And if you don't know that, then you just don't know what you're talking about. And we'll start our own brawl here. (laughs) Yeah, they we were separated by a few thousand miles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Get an email oh a punch. Goodness. You know what they need? They need some armed guards out uh, over there to protect that uh, church. That's what they need. There you go. That'll there end that. <clears throat> well, we've heard of different times about the uh, church violence. Um, not not among members of the church itself, but all of a sudden somebody walks in with a gun and um, starts shooting the place up or something like that. All right. And so some churches are going to add armed or have added armed guards. 
So we have, um, uh, what's this church? Church in Kentucky. Uh, High View Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. It's the biggest Baptist church in Kentucky. And they have a volunteer security force with at least one armed guard doing any worship service. They also have a medical team on the grounds during weekend services uh, because thousands of people pass through its doors. Um, I was happy to hear that it's, it says every member of the security team, from ushers to medics to armed guards, receives some kind of training related to their post, be it conflict management or anti-terrorism tactics. They said, we realize that as the largest Baptist church in Kentucky, we'd be a little naive to think someone would, or to think something would never happen to us. Um, is a pastor who's also a police officer. We're catching up in an area, in an era of terrorism and church is no different. You know, the reality is that, especially in a big church like that, that, you know, terrorists are going to go after large groups of people and, you know, you got a church with you where you got thousands of people going through there. Uh, that's a pretty big target. So, so how many of your ushers are trained in anti-terrorism tactics? <laughs> you know, the funny thing is we did go through, even though we're a tiny little church, um, we did go through a disaster response. Uh, our, our district has a, a packet, um, available, um, CD-ROM kind of deal. And, um, and our stewardship board, went through their materials and, you know, and yeah, a lot of it was, it, it presented all kinds of situations from, you know, tornadoes to, uh, somebody walks in with a gun or, or whatever. Um, and they had the whole range of, of different stuff. And, um, and so we kind of went through there and we went, well, okay. Um, we probably don't need to worry about being a terrorism target given the, paltry number of people that we have on any given Sunday. Um, you know, we're just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And so we don't attract huge crowds here. And so, you know, we didn't really worry too much about that kind of stuff, but you know, there was a lot of other stuff that we looked at and, you know, what if the church burns down or what if, you know, just all kinds of stuff. How do you deal with the media? Uh, how do you deal? You know, the main thing is to have a go-to person. Um, which they kind of designated me as, which I guess made sense. Um, but even stuff like, you know, what if your pastor has a heart attack all of a sudden? Um, which, you know, I'm not really planning on, but you know, what do you do? Um, and so, you know, we've got at our church at any given service, we generally have at least one EMT, if not more. Um, you know, we live in a community of volunteer firemen and things like that. And so uh, a lot of first responders in that. And we've got a few and a couple of registered nurses that are pretty regular attenders and stuff. So, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of covered on the medical front. Um, you know, as far as somebody walking in with a gun or something like that, you know, we wouldn't really be prepared. But it'd be kind of pointless for them, really. I mean, if they wanted to hold up the place, there's just not enough money in our church um, on any given Sunday that it'd be worth robbing. Uh, they'd be much better off going down to the next town over, um, in either direction. Yeah. But the, the reality is, is a lot of times it's not to get the money. It's just to cause, you know, worry and fear and things like that. Yeah. See, my question is anybody in your church packing heat, you know, cause it says, um, says here that, you know, uh, in states where people are allowed to carry concealed weapons, volunteers have become a cost-effective means of providing security at some churches. Um, <clears throat> if you have people using guns, says Glenn Evans, a consultant who is on the safety team of his church, they need to be trained to know when to use them. Yes. So I just want to know, you know, you got your ushers packing heat there. No. No, none of that. No. Not as far as I know. Do you got something underneath, you know, your robes there up there, you know? No. <laughs> no, I've, I've, you know, I've got my pectoral cross, but it doesn't really uh, double as a shuriken or anything like that. So, um, and you know, the, the, uh, the cross is up in front. You can't like go whoosh and, you know, pull a sword out of it or anything like that. No, but you know, it'd be really cool if they could open up and have machine guns on the inside. <laughs> 
Yeah, or, you know, I just press a button on the altar and it all of a sudden transforms into this giant fighting mech, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, we have, Transformers, yeah. buy them all. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we haven't installed that mod yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we're just going to take our chances for now. Yeah, well... Yeah, but, you know, it is a serious situation. Whew, excuse me, I woke up this morning at 5.30, so I only got about five, I got about five hours of sleep last night, so I'm, I'm kind of tired. But, um, you know, different areas of the country, it is, you know, you don't know what's going to walk in off the street, and it's particularly in a large congregation, a, lar- a large church. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be a very tempting target for someone, and, you know, you know, and, and again, not necessarily a, uh, an actual terror attack, but just could be somebody, some nutso with a with a gun who shows up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they were talking about, um, you know, uh, um, a gunman in Colorado where four people and uh, you know five were wounded at two churches. Yeah, you know, the church that I was confirmed in uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. That place is not in the, it's not in the best neighborhood. And, uh, so that one, I can actually see something happening. I mean, we get all kinds of people come in off the streets, um, throughout the week. I mean, I had pastors tell me stories and things like that of the regulars that would stop in and things like that. And, you know, just, just all kinds of strange stuff. And, uh, it's just in kind of one of those weird neighborhoods that, uh, you never, you never know who's going to come walking in, which on the one hand is great. I mean, you've got, you know, all kinds of people that are, uh, sort of ripe for sharing the gospel, but, um, you just, you know, you'd be, and that place was robbed on a regular basis. They didn't keep any money, um, in the building. So it was always taken right after the service, you know, to the bank. So you didn't really have, you know, there was, that people would come in and try to rob it, but they couldn't get anything. Hmm. We had uh, a security system on our church, and uh, a lot of times the false alarm went off in the middle of the night, and um, they called me to go over there. So, um, well, they had a security system well, there too. So, but, but now if you get shot, how do you know when you're really dead? Ending on a serious and this note. one, I, yeah, this is kind of a serious note here, uh, and this is um, Children's National Hospital where this is taking place. That's what the picture is of, um, <clears throat> and this is kind of sad. Um, there's a there's a 12 year old boy, and his parents and he are all Orthodox Jews, and the doctors have said this kid's brain dead. Um, you know, he's not. He's got, uh, was diagnosed with, with brain cancer. Um, and they, they pronounced him dead on two, a week ago Tuesday. Uh, said the test found no brain activity. So they want to disconnect him from the ventilator and, you know, disconnect from, uh, intravenous medication. And his parents, who are Orthodox Jews, says just because his heart is, his brain's not functioning, that, that doesn't mean he, he's dead. Um, <clears throat> You know, they, uh, they say their faith does not define death as the cessation of brain function alone. How do they define it? Do you know? I don't know. Because, you know, if it's like if, if it's the heart's still beating and the lungs are still operating, well, I mean, you can keep a person pretty much indefinitely doing that. Um, that doesn't mean they're alive, though. You know, this does bring up the whole question and, you know, and, and different churches define it different ways and things. And, um, you know, I would generally go with a, a medical definition of death. Now, you know, there's it, where the gray area, as far as I'm concerned, is um, a person who's not dead, but, you know, considered beyond saving or something like that. You know, um, <clears throat> there's some some real gray areas there. And, you know, generally when, when people are asking me about it, what I tell them is, well, are you preserving life or are you prolonging death? You know, if this person is, 
is, you know, they're in a irreversible coma. They're just slowly going downhill. There's machines keeping them alive. And as soon as you turn off those machines, they're going to die. And there's just no, you know, short of a miracle, there's absolutely no way that that person is coming out um, of that. And it's just, you know, as time goes on, it's just getting worse. Um, you know, then I say, well, you know, sometimes the, the time comes where you have to say, you know what, um, it's, you know, it, it, it really seems to be time, uh, for this person, this person really, and it, you know, in, in that sense is, is already gone and, <laughs> you know, we're just keeping the body functioning. And so at that point you're not killing that person. That person, you know, is probably, you know, as, as far as I could figure is already in heaven. Um, right. Well, there's a difference, I think, between hastening death, you know, actually actively, you know, killing someone, mm-hmm. or, and in this case, just letting nature take its course and just letting death take, you know, take over, because there's no way this person's really alive anyway. Right. Uh, and I feel, I feel for this poor family, mm-hmm. because, you know, they, I mean, seriously, I mean, who's going to pay for this? I mean, the insurance company has got to come to a point and say, sorry, look, we, we respect your beliefs, but we can't, you know, keep paying out the money to keep this kid, on, this kid on, on a ventilator. So if you want to pay for it, go ahead. But, yeah. I mean, you know. But the hospital's saying, look, you know, this equipment, um, we need this for people that actually could be helped by it, you know, and the, the bed. And, you know, they said that they can't, um, they tried to find other facilities to take him, but that none would admit him because he's brain dead. You know, so, I mean, yeah, my heart goes out to the family. You know, if, if that's their belief that, that that's a really tough thing for them. Um, you know, if that's the case, I think that it would behoove the, um, the Orthodox Jewish church to, or synagogue or whatever they call it to, um, to come up with some kind of system for dealing with this when it happens. Um, I imagine it's not all that common, but, you know, if, if, if something like this is going to happen, um, and, and you have your beliefs run contrary to the rest of society, then you need to come up with a way to, to deal with it when it happens. So, but, I yeah, agree. I, and I don't think this is a very good way. And it, I, I really, I don't like the, the idea that, the, you know, they're, they're suing the, the hospital, you know, for violating their religious freedom. I'm not sure how. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. and as a matter of fact, they said they even tried to find another facility to take him, but everybody else said, no, he's brain dead. We're not taking him. Um, so it I seems mean, like the hospital's done everything they can. You know, right. within there, and there comes the point I think where you finally admit the person has died. Yeah, I mean, I so I, I hope and pray that I never have to go through that. I hope and pray that none of you who are watching and listening um, ever have to. If you have, um, you know, uh, all I can say is, and this is no small thing. Um, but just remember the resurrection, remember that, mm-hmm. you know, and this is the hope that we have that they don't. And maybe, maybe that's why we see it differently. I mean, it's not that we value human life any differently, but you know, we know that even when you, when you come to those tough decisions where you have to decide and you're not sure, okay, is this person already gone or is there something more that we could do? And, you know, and you struggle with that, um, you know, what it comes down to is you make the best decision and then you rest on the mercy of God, knowing that, you know, he is the Lord of life and death that, you know, we were talking about this in church, uh, in our Bible class this morning about how Jesus chose the exact moment of his death. You know, he was in complete control over it. And, um, so that when he was on the cross, you know, he cried out in a loud voice and then he, and then he died. And with crucifixion, you don't, cry out in a loud voice so clearly or at least not right before you die and so i mean he was in control and chose that moment which incidentally mm-hmm. and, and by no coincidence um was the exact moment that um that time of the at three o'clock in the afternoon is when the um when the, the lamb was sacrificed 
uh, in the temple. Um, so that was an interesting thing that I just learned. Um, but, uh, so, you know, he's the, but, you know, it doesn't end there. It, it goes on. And, um, mm-hmm. and then after the cross, uh, where our sins were forgiven, then you get to, uh, the resurrection. There's following Good Friday, you have Easter. And so we have the resurrection to look forward to. We have the promise that, um, whatever, you know, trials, whatever struggles, whatever difficult decisions that we have to make in our lives, that all of that will come to an end and Christ is going to come back. He's going to raise us from the dead and, and we won't have to deal with that kind of stuff anymore. And, but it also means that anybody that you do lose, any family member that you lose, whether it be something like this or, you know, or any other way that we also have the assurance of the resurrection that, that we will be reunited. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, that's, that's our hope. And it, it really, I think it really just changes how we deal with, with all of these things. Because when you keep that in mind, yeah, it's still hard. You're still going to miss them. I mean, obviously, you know, death is still the enemy, but death is the defeated enemy. And so, you know, it's, we, we know uh, throughout that. And I've talked to so many widows, um, that, you know, after their funeral and, and, and they say, boy, you know, I just can't imagine going through this without the, the certain hope of the resurrection. You know, how do people that don't know that deal with this kind of stuff? I just can't imagine. So, but yeah, we have that and wow, it just changes everything. A very nice plane. Yeah, we, I was at a funeral last week and, um, Wonderful, one. Uh, um, not I, it was the the, the uh, mother of uh, one of my members, and uh, so it was at another Lutheran church, and uh, he was talking about uh, you know her joy in Christ and her hope, and that her hope was in the resurrection, and uh, that you know she said, and she couldn't wait to get to heaven, and she could not wait to see her friends and and see her dear husband. I uh, could not wait to see her husband. She'd missed him for all these years. And she said, I know exactly what my husband's going to say to me when he sees me. What the hell took you so long? <laughs> <laughs> and he said this right in the pulpit. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was... <clears throat> that was our, that was our, our fun. That was, uh, that was, Crack us up! Just, 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 just brought the place down when he said that. So uh, that's our hope. It is indeed. Um, maybe you've got some opinions and thoughts uh, about the Mormons and their commercial. Maybe about this situation. Maybe when you get, maybe we have an, an authority out there in Orthodox Judaism who can help us understand uh, their position a little bit better in this. Uh, please write to us at uh, podcast at crossfeednews dot com. Yep, or if you're watching this on YouTube or wherever, one of those other places, uh, you can uh, just post a comment right below. And boy, we got some interesting comments. <laughs> uh, well, let's just put it this way, folks. You remember the one we did on Are You Offended, episode 91, I think it was, and with Kenny and Spenny, his fan, their fans do not like us. <laughs> not one bit. I think they're trying to offend us. I wasn't offended. I was just sort of amused. Um, <laughs> I, I can't read. YouTube does not have profanity filters. Um, so in order to avoid an explicit uh, rating on this show, uh, I can't read the message to you. Um, nor would I like to uh, pass those words through my mouth anyway. Um, but... <sighs> they just don't like... <laughs> They, you know, and, mean, they, 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 and they said so very colorfully. <laughs> yeah. Now, they said, you talked about telling Canadian Christians to accept, accept homosexuality that it's not a sin, that calling it a sin is considered hate. Which, that didn't even make sense, and it's not what we said, but I, I think I understand what he was, we were talking about that, um, about the hate speech laws in Canada and, and, and whatever, and, and, um, that yes, it's, it is sin. And, and, um, so I, you know, here they're accusing us of being hateful. 
Um, With a whole bunch of expletives. <laughs> <laughs> I, as they said in Star Trek many years ago, colorful metaphors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so yeah. I, I said, I, I responded to this, and, you know, maybe I shouldn't have, but I said, so we're hateful because we disagree with you, but spewing obscenities at us over... Um, our beliefs isn't hateful. That seems hypocritical to me. And then we got a response that said, what are you talking about? I never said I wasn't a hypocrite. <laughs> okay, well, we agree on that. <laughs> um, but, and well. th this next one I couldn't even understand. I said, I never said homosexuality was a sin. Therefore, I never didn't agree with you. Just spend a little time trying to wrap your head around that one. <laughs> and... Uh, what? Well, but, and that is a, you called Kenny ugly and stupid. Yeah, Jim, you did that. Um, an idiot. And I thought that you were a pastor. Joking or not, you're in no position to judge. Ha ha, Kenny is better looking than you. <laughs> Can't probably, really argue. probably isn't anything much. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, we were just kidding. <laughs> it was because we were talking about being offensive. So, um, boy, I guess they got offended. Something. I guess they were, you know, and uh, but uh, oh well, go ahead, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever turns your crank, guys, you know, I'm, I'm glad it excites you. If, if you're gonna offend us, though, you're gonna have to try harder. I'm sorry, you know, um, expletives just won't do it. I, you know, those I heard them all when I was in junior high, so they they really <laughs> they really don't uh, get me all uptight now. Mm -hmm. So. You know, these these comments remind me, and I actually, I read this in a book, I read this quote, which really upset me because I think I said it first, and I should have trademarked the line or copyrighted it or something, but I read it, somebody else, it had somebody else's name to it, but I, I said this back as early as 1993, that once upon a time, they said, an infinite amount, infinite amount of monkeys on an infinite amount of typewriters would eventually type Shakespeare. Thanks to the internet, we know that's not true. <laughs> yep, I've heard that one too. <laughs> but, but I think I have said it first. I, I know I said that back in like 92 or 93, like 93 or 94. It said a long time ago, just when the web was getting going. You know, the, the irony is, is I just, you, I just referenced that in a haiku today. Um, there's this contest that some blog is having about, um, it was, it's a, a Twitter thing that you have to, um, write a, a haiku on Twitter and then, uh, you'd like post it in their comment thing. And, uh, the winner gets a MacBook Air, but the contest is over at the end of today. So, um, so I posted mine and it was something I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. It was a Twitter related thing. So if, if you don't know Twitter, and you're not familiar with it, you might not get it, but it was um, Infinite Monkeys uh, typing Shakespeare 140, because 140 characters is the limit on a Twitter post. Uh, fail whale for the win, because uh, the Twitter keeps going down, uh, the service gets overwhelmed. And when it goes down, there's there's this whale that shows up on their um, page, and it's called the fail whale. So um, I know when you have to explain it, it's just not funny anymore. But uh, <laughs> Twitter's just not mainstream enough yet. But So I'm hoping that next week I can announce that I won a MacBook Air, because I was reading through the other ones that people had posted, and I thought mine was the best, but I'm a little biased. So. <laughs> Well, hopefully you won't have to explain it to them. Hey, folks, that's it for this week again. If you got any comments, um, sans colorful metaphors, crossfeed at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, go to our site, post stories, post comments, all that thing's good. God be with you and give you a good week. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless.